Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Unstoppable Podcast. I'm your host, Diana Chen, and I'm here today with our guest, Meta Dreamer. He's one of the founders at Meta Factory, which is a digi-physical culture studio where you can buy basically like a, a, a physical item of clothing and then get a digital equivalent to that as well that you can wear around crypto voxels. So super excited to speak with Meta Dreamer, Dreamer more about this. We've talked about the metaverse a lot on this podcast. It's something that I'm really excited about and uh, just can't wait to chat with him more about, you know, how he sees all of this playing out and what role Meta Factory is going to have in all of it. So welcome Meta Dreamer. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Diana. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. And yeah, looking forward to chatting all things metaverse and crypto and DAOs and all that fun stuff. Awesome. So before we dive into Metafactory, I want to know a little bit more about your background and how you got into crypto in the first place. So take us back to when you first heard about crypto. What was it that drew you in? And then how did you start learning more about it? Um, yeah, so it, it's pretty funny. Uh, basically, uh, I was, you know, in in like junior high and you know on these forums about runescape uh and people were talking about bitcoin back then and like mining bitcoin um so that's where i like first heard about it and you know for me at that point i didn't really like think about the larger implications of it i was just like oh this is a cool way to make money um so like i was like mining bitcoin and selling it for money back then uh didn't really think to actually keep any but <laughs> um that that was kind of like my my first exposure point um to crypto wow that's pretty nuts so how did you how, like how did you figure out how to do all of that when you were in junior high so um it, it's pretty funny so my dad uh was telling me that i shouldn't get a job and i should focus on school and my studies so i had to figure out you know, an alternative way to make money. Um, and that happened to be building and selling computers. So I happened to like have a lot of like extra computer parts um, laying around and I, I use those to, to start mining. Um, and in general, like I've, I like grew up, you know, with computers and with the internet and, you know, playing these games. So um, it, all this like digital currency stuff kind of like intuitively made sense to me because you know, in RuneScape and other MMORPGs, you have these like digital currencies within these games. Um, so for me, it was just like, this is like just the same thing, but it has real world value. Um, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, that is um, definitely something that uh, is has been fascinating to me is when you speak with people from a younger generation, it is a lot more intuitive to them, like digital currencies, NFTs, all of that are just so much more intuitive than it is to the older generation who typically tries to equate these Web3 concepts to something in the Web2 world that they already know. Um, and that can be a challenge. And so, I, yeah, I, that actually brings up a good point. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Like as we are building out Web3, is it what's the better approach? Is it to sort of build out a Web3 equivalent of what we already have in our physical world? Or is it to build out uh, something digitally native and, you know, have that sort of mentality? Um, yeah, I kind of see it like if you look at the early days of the Internet, it's the same thing where people were kind of just taking like existing concepts and throwing Internet at it. Like, you know, you had radio on the Internet and books on the Internet and just like things that already existed on the Internet. But the Internet didn't really take off until sort of like the social media era, which you have like Snapchat and Instagram and all these things. And these are sort of new paradigms and like technologies that were only really possible with the Internet, not before the Internet. And similarly with Web3, I think, you know, from 2017 up until now, like we've a lot of people have been focusing on like, you know, let's like throw blockchain at like existing problems that have like existing solutions. But for me, the most exciting part about Web3 is really this new design space that opens up where we can now experiment with things that have never been possible before. Um, and I think that's where the most interesting stuff is, because, um, you know, even when it comes to like getting people to use stuff, if we just have like a blockchain equivalent of something that already exists, then, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to convince them to like use this like harder to use more risky, more like uncertain version of something that they're already used to using versus if we create um, a, a brand new experience that's never possible before, you kind of see it with NFTs, right? Like digital art and like ha digital art having value wasn't possible before, but now it is. And that's why it really, I think, took off. 
Um, so uh, yeah, I think like it, it takes a while for us to like unlearn these legacy concepts and you know figure out what what really is possible in in Web three. But that's that's really what we wanted to do with MetaFactory. Um, it's interesting because we have like this bridge um, to the to the physical world and the real world, but the the way in which we're like doing things um from like a coordination perspective from like a you know community involvement ownership you know transparency all all that stuff is kind of uh taking a whole new spin on what it means to be a brand um and have a community around a brand yeah for sure so let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about meta factory so i i'm sure the intro i gave was very um simplified and there's a lot more to it than just you know a physical physical hoodie and then a digital hoodie uh there's a lot more to it than that so tell people you know just exactly what metafactory is and all, all the different components of it yeah so um metafactory is a lot of things but we kind of like to describe it as like a composable merch platform for decentralized communities um we basically create uh we, we partner with artists brands um communities and kind of bring a bunch of different people together uh, and, and create cool like cultural artifacts um, that celebrate crypto culture and help these communities sort of um, spread spread their community culture and in, in a in a format that's pretty sort of familiar to a lot of people. Because if you think about Web2 creators and communities and, you know, you go to a concert, you get merch, you know, so merch has this very like tangible like understood value um in these sort of things but we're we're taking a web3 spin on it so um it's it's more than just like we produce and sell merch with this merch you you get like your robot token with it so which is like our governance token so in a way you're not only a consumer of our products but also like an owner of the platform and you can shape the way in which it develops and influence it um you know you get access to members only channels depending on how much robot you have there's all these other dynamics to it um and we're also focusing really on this like digiphysical aspect where um how can we take what it means to like what fashion and what impact that has on culture like take that paradigm and bring it into the digital world um so much of our lives especially after the pandemic have become super digitized but that sort of feeling of you know wearing Yeezys to school and like the the sort of those social dynamics and feeling like a part of this community culture like and how that works with fashion that really hasn't translated online yet um but we can we can use nfts and create these like experiential economies around these things um i think like metafactory's product isn't really the merch that we sell but more so like the entire experience where you you might just buy merch but then you know with the merch you get these tokens and you wonder oh what are these tokens it sends you down that rabbit hole um then you get this nft and then you have this wearable and you learn about crypto voxels and um sandbox and decentraland and you start exploring all these things so there's a lot of like rabbit holes or breadcrumbs that we leave for people um and and that's really what gets the community excited is that we're creating these experiences that they can be a part of and they can help shape and define and um you know uh be vested in the sort of int have like a vested stake in it as well you know um we with, with this token it really helps to align the incentives of everyone who's taking part in this in that you know we're all going to win together or we're all going to lose together so um i think we're a, a lot of what we do is like figuring out these new like token mechanics these coordination mechanisms um you know all the way from like the production side as well where we're actually distributing our tokens to the people that produce the merch and design the merch and um figuring out how can we like distribute royalties and uh have like a more fair uh economy around this where you know in, in the traditional fashion industry there's so many issues around you know uh brands like Zara sort of sucking up the entire market and um the people who are involved in sort of every step of the process not really getting a cut of that upside even though they have such a important role to play um so there's a lot of things that we're doing on the physical production side and the um the the fashion industry side that's that's pretty innovative too so um like kind of bridging it all together um and using these tools to like figure out how can we uh, create these new economies um in which people are both like participants and owners and can influence it and um it, it's much more fair and transparent and you know uh it's it's a better more fun experience for everyone
Yeah, for sure. That's super cool. And I'm wondering, like, how did you get the idea for this in the first place? Because as far as I'm aware, I don't think there are any other projects or protocols doing this right now. I know there's digital X, but they're only doing the digital side of it. And then, you know, obviously the, the physical side. And when you first got this idea, was it like scary to you at all or overwhelming that you basically had to like it's like running two businesses basically you have to run like a traditional clothing business where you have production and things like that and then you have to run a digital you know a, a web3 business um all in one so like how how did this how did this idea get born in your head and then you know how did you start even like begin to start working on this yeah so um the idea itself wasn't mine it was um it came out of meta cartel basically, which is like a, a grants funding DAO. It's a lot of like prominent people in the ecosystem. Um, and this was around DevCon 5 in Osaka. So um, it was uh, Drew and some others. Um, they're basically thinking, you know, everyone like has all this like conference merch, you know, everyone's like giving out these shirts and, you know, it'd be cool if you can actually like do better than just like a logo on a shirt, you know, like actually have something that's cooler that we want to wear that's, you know, um, helps like spread crypto culture um in a way and you know uh, everyone's it's, it's hard too for everyone to figure it out on their own right like especially these communities that are decentralized communities they like you said there's this like aspect we have to bridge to the physical world you know um they have to figure out how to produce this stuff pay for it you know there's taxes and profit like there's all these like complications um so the idea came for swag DAO. that's what it was originally called actually um a DAO to coordinate like producing swag for other um, projects and communities. Um, and then they they posted on it, they posted about it on Twitter. It was a branding competition for SwagDAO. Um, and that's where I first saw it. Um, at this point, I was like kind of, you know, looking around in the crypto Twitter, like looking for places to get involved and contribute. And um, prior to this, I had like a fashion tech startup I was running. And so it, it kind of like this, sort of aligned all my different interests in like crypto and fashion and um you know DAOs. so uh i i that's where i came up with the meta factory brand um and i i got involved from there um and in terms of like what we are now like a lot of it is sort of just emergent like we never really had any of these ideas at the start you know it just started with like let's make better like conference swag um but then you know we ran into people had conversations you know um like Wes for example he's someone in the traditional fashion industry who came in and connected us with like all these designers in like Sweden um who are thinking of like fashion 3.0 basically and more sustainable ways of like cutting patterns and you know really like cutting edge stuff so um for for us it was like we just created that like cultural container that like, like space for people to like experiment it's like a fertile garden and then you know kind of things just started sprouting up and people started bringing ideas and you know that's like what we what we have now um and i i really really believe in that sort of method of you know developing a product or developing an idea is not necessarily trying to you know craft it and dictate it yourself but just you know going with the flow you know just doing what's fun like doing what feels right um and you just end up you know running into the right people and having the right conversations and you know things kind of uh just emerged into like what meta factory is now that's awesome um so you mentioned earlier too you know the emphasis on community and letting people who hold your robot tokens vote on you know maybe what projects you're working on next or what artists you're working with next how is meta factory structured today is it still structured like a DAO, or is it structured like a traditional company that um you know just takes input from uh, customers like on discord and surveys and things like that um or yeah how is it structured yeah so the that side of things is actually one of the most interesting things like the first year like a, a majority of that first year was spent on like the legal engineering side of it on like figuring out okay we want to do this as a DAO, but we have to deal with like producing physical things like a lot of crypto stuff is just kind of like within crypto it's like a crypto product that deals with crypto things but for us we're sort of at that intersection between crypto and like fashion in the real world so you know we have to figure out who's going to pay taxes how do we you know accept credit cards all this sort of stuff and what we came to and what what, what we sort of came up with is this like two entity model where we have like a meta factory llc that acts as like the oracle to the real world for the DAO. 
um, and you know that's the entity that takes the payments, pays the production partners, you know, pays taxes, like does all that legal side of th things, and then we have a separate like uh, entity which is the DAO on chain, and the DAO is essentially where all the governance decisions happen, and you know the the LLC is essentially supposed to be a really lightweight like placeholder or like Oracle, and you know the there's like a social contract that you know the the LLC is going to act in the best interest of the DAO and you know the DAO, the decisions that the DAO makes the LLC will then you know um act in in that uh, capacity so uh we create this like separation but still have this like social link between them um and you know the the token itself to at the highest like tier which is like a thousand robot you get access to like all of the company's like records and financials and profits and losses. So, you know, we have like a full, like a model of like full transparency as much transparency with the community as possible. Um, Cause uh, you know, a lot of people, when they talk about decentralization, um, it, it's not really about technical decentralization as much as it is about transparency and like the culture of decentralization. So, you know, if people, can can see everything that this LLC is doing. Um, if they're like you know members of the DAO, then it, it kind of like de-risks it without like the LLC needing to be fully decentralized. Um, and in fact, you see a lot of the times things that are like technologically decentralized but politically centralized. You know, so it might uh, on chain it might look like it's decentralized, but just based on like who holds the tokens and like all the political stuff, like it can have a culture of like opacity and you know not having. Um, the true like ethos of decentralization yeah for sure that that's super cool and so to join the DAO, you just need to hold robot tokens and then is it the only way to hold robot tokens is to buy something from metafactory yeah so we we airdrop tokens to anyone who buys merch anyone who designs merch anyone who like contributes in any way to metafactory so um like we we airdrop tokens to any community that works with us uh to you know if they want to drop merch then they get they get their rewards and robot tokens um but people can also buy robot tokens from other contributors so the this the way the robot is seeded into the market is through like contributors um and then contributors can then sell on sell to other people and they can buy it on on a dex you know we, it's on balancer right now where we have our main liquidity pool um but yeah, the you know we didn't have any token sale. We didn't like raise any capital. It's all been like bootstrapped. And you know, uh, if you think about it, like people like raise a bunch of money from VCs to then pay contributors and then give the tokens to the VCs. Instead, we just like give the tokens to the contributors directly um, and sort of like skip that step. And you know, uh, it, it creates like a more credibly neutral and like community owned and community first um, model for for this. Yeah, for sure. Going peer to peer, which is like the whole ethos of decentralization, cutting out the middleman. Uh, cool. So walk me through what happens. So if I go on your website and I purchase an item of merch, um, I so I buy that and then it gets shipped to me, you know, in two weeks or whatever. And then what happens after that? Like, how do I go about getting my digital merch as well? And then how do I set it up and things like that? Yeah, so um, basically when you check out on our shop, there's a little field where you can drop your ETH address in. Um, so then we have a record of like everything people have bought um, and what ETH address they had. And then uh, with our robot token, every like six to eight weeks, we like retro distribute it to everyone who bought stuff in the last like six to eight weeks. Um, and, you know, you get it proportional to how much you spent. And then for the for the wearables, there's some wearables that we've created but um the our our full like um interoperable metaverse wearable standard like we're still in the process of developing it but um it's basically going to be like retro airdropped on everyone who produced stuff um so for, for us like it's the the unique part about us that we're trying to do is like we're trying to have one nft wearable that's like acts as um you can it represents this garment in like multiple different worlds where right, right now you have like wearables in one world but that doesn't necessarily work or port over to other worlds um so you kind of have these like silos but 
you know, when, when you think about the metaverse, it, it's not really about one specific world. It's about all these worlds connected um, and, and the bridge between them. So we're, uh, we're really trying to push on, on our standards for and help develop standards. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of alignment with, you know, these virtual world projects. Like, you know, we have to talk to Decentraland. We have to talk to CryptoVoxels, you know, um, get them on board with it. But it, it, it's it's coming along well. I think end of August is when we're going to be sending out like our first batch. Um, but yeah, you'll be able to have a single NFT that you can wear in Decentraland and um, in Webiverse, uh, Crypto Voxels, um, all these different worlds, even like an AR version. So you can like have like a Snapchat lens where you can kind of wear it on your um, like physical body, like uh, overlaid, um, which is pretty cool. So uh, the and the other thing too is like we want these NFTs to be future proof. So um if if like let's say fortnite adds support for you know nft wearables um we want that we want to be able to like retroactively add support for for these like new virtual worlds and these new standards um because like all this metaverse stuff it's like really really new and fresh um and bleeding edge so um we're kind of like paving the path um and it the standards aren't really like well defined yet so um, there's a lot of things that can change in the next few years, but uh, we, we want to make sure the NFTs that we distribute have that longevity and that long-term value proposition. And people know that, you know, it can, uh, these will be future-proofed. Um, so yeah, f- like figuring out all these details uh, takes some time, but um, we're getting there. Yeah. So when you say uh, these, the you know, you're, it's sort of creating a new standard. So are these wearable NFTs, ERC 721s or is it a different standard? Yeah, so the it, it's still so there'll be 1155s actually, um, where it's like the one wearable is fungible with the other. Um, some of them will be 721s, like for our Genesis items, which are numbered. But the the common stuff is going to be 1155s. Um, the this the unique part about the standard is more so in the metadata rather than the token standard. So um, with the metadata, usually you have only one file as like this is the file for this NFT. But um, because there's all these like different virtual worlds, we need like multiple different file types. And so uh, instead of just one file linked to this NFT, we're going to have multiple different files. Um, and we want to standardize that that format so that um, anyone who also follows this format, it'll work with, you know, these different virtual worlds. And, you know, we only have to like come to uh, an agreement once, you know, between like, Decentraland and Webverse and all these different projects, um, you know, that this is how you like look up, look up what your file is for for your specific world. Um, and then once we create that standard, then other people can adopt it. And then hopefully it'll help uh, other people also mint, you know, universal interoperable wearables. Gotcha. Very cool. So would this be, I'm just trying to like um, imagine, you know, different applications of it in the future. Would this be something where, uh, it, it could be, you know, a wearable that I could add onto any of my NFT avatars, for instance, like if I have a cool cat, if I have a fame lady, if I have like all these different things, a crypto punk, would it be possible to be in a, you know, to, to have a standard created so that I can buy any wearable off of Metafactory? And I'm like, today, I want my cool cat to wear this hoodie. Tomorrow, I want my crypto punk to wear this. Like, is that something that could happen one day? Yeah. So, you know, that that's our sort of, you know, big vision. That's where we want to get to. Um, but it, it, it's really difficult, you know, when, especially with avatars, where you can have like an avatar that's like this tall, you know, and walking around, or it can, have, or it can be like this huge thing. Like there's so much variance between um, what these avatars look like and their, their form and stuff. So um, you, you, there's even like this whole... It, uh, you, you notice that it all a lot in the Japanese community. They're they're sort of like five years ahead of everyone else in terms of like virtual worlds. Um, but in, in there, there's like this whole market for like virtual tailors essentially that can take a wearable and like modify it for to fit on like your certain avatar. Um, so you know it, it's going to take time for this tooling to develop. I don't think like Metafactory needs to be the one to develop it. There's so many other like companies and projects trying to figure these things out. So. Um, it's almost like a waiting game to see what, uh, what ends up, you know, becoming popular and becoming like a workable standard and then adopting it. Um, I think like AI is going to play a big part in this because we can, 
you know, you can, tr you can imagine you could train an AI model to take like a garment and an avatar and figure out like how to manipulate it to fit that avatar and, you know, have it be a lot more seamless. Um, but uh, right now it's still, it's still kind of clunky. Um, even like, you know, when it comes to like, even if you have like the wearable and the avatar that it fits in game, like it's not as easy, just like equipping it. You still have to go into some avatar configurator and like attach all these points, um, you know, specifically for fashion, it's difficult because you want the arms to be moving with the movements of the character. So there's like rigging involved in sort of like, you know, how the, how the arm's going to move, how's the torso going to move um, in relation to everything else. So, um, the, but th there's a lot of companies working on smoothing these processes out and making it a lot easier. And, you know, we're going to try to like keep on the bleeding edge of it and work with any teams on figuring this stuff out. Yeah, super cool. So I want to talk about the artist side of what you guys do a little bit more. Um, so on, on your website, the way that the merch is organized is it's organized in collections. And uh, these collections are like Bankless, Sushi. Um, and then within each collection, the different pieces of merch are can be designed by different artists and designers. And so I'm, I'm curious, how do you guys go about working out, you know, which collection you're going to drop next, which artists you're going to work with? How do you how do you find these artists? Yeah, so um, it's so up until now, it's been pretty like ad hoc. It's like, you know, someone mentioned something on Twitter, like, oh, someone should make a shirt that says this. And then we're like, okay, let's go do that. Or, you know, someone hits us up in DMs and we kind of just take it on as, uh, as we have the capacity. But now it's getting to the point where we have like way more inbound interest than we can actually handle. Um, so this is kind of where uh, like the next phase of our robot token comes in. Um, we're building something called the curation game. Um, creation game is basically a prediction market on future merch and it allows the community to um, essentially like vote or stake their tokens on what merch they want produced or what merch they want to see and then earn a reward based on how well that merch sells um, so it, it kind of creates this incentive for people to help filter all the incoming interest um, for what's going to be the most popular uh, what's, in, what's the most in demand and that way once we actually put something in production, we know it's going to, you know, be guaranteed to sell out and have like this whole community of people who are, who have a vested interest in like generating sales for it. Um, so yeah, this, that curation game, I think will help to sort of democratize and open up and make transparent that whole process of like what projects we take on. Um, uh, up until then, it's still basically, you know, you fill out a form um, and, you know, based on how much like capacity we have and how like big your project is then we'll we'll take it on or kind of put it on the back burner um you know sushi and bankless these are like huge communities in the crypto space so um the, these are ones that we wanted to to really you know put a lot of time and effort into and develop this relationship um a lot of the drops we do are also like one of one or like one-off drops you know it's just like an artist that comes or a community that comes and you just do one drop and you don't really make a whole collection um, but we're starting to like move into this phase where um, we create like, you know, we have this whole partnership with Bankless DAO. Um, so it's like a DAO on DAO partnership where, um, you know, they're going to be creating like a merch drop every month for, for the next year. And we've like sort of committed to that. Um, same with Sushi. You know, we're going to be working together to, to create these um, ongoing drops for the Sushi community and, you know, figure out ways to involve artists and, you know, have this like collaborative space in which people can, you know, bring their creativity and we can let sort of like the best ideas win. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I noticed on your website too, that a lot of the merch from the past have been sold out already. So I'm wondering how often do you drop a new piece and how quickly does it normally sell out? Yeah. So, um, recently we've been dropping maybe like, one or two pieces a week maybe like one and a half two pieces a week um they've in they so initially they were selling out really quickly um but more after this sort of like little bear market um things kind of like slowed down a bit and it depends on the community too right like how um excited those community members are about the merch um but most of the popular stuff like sells out pretty quick. Um, we've also been experimenting with like different sales models. So instead of having like a limited quantity, it's a limited time. Um, like, so the latest bankless drop, for example, the ultrasound summer, like t-shirt and shorts, um, they're available for sale until August 5th. 
Um, so however many we sell in that time period, that's what we'll produce and, and ship out. Um, so yeah, then it, it becomes less of a race, but it lets everyone sort of have a, have a chance at getting it, um, but still keeps that scarcity in that it's only going to be produced this one time. It's not going to be produced again. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting though. Like the, the scarcity plays a huge aspect, um, or like plays a huge role in, in the demand for these things. And a lot of the early stuff, um, people, you know, bought it up really quick because they knew that the last time something dropped, it sold out. So they wanted to make sure they got the next one. Um, and, you know, these scarcity games are a thing in the, you know, fashion industry, like the hype beast culture and, you know, the the sneakers and all that. Um, that aligns with like, you know, crypto does scarcity really well. So those two kind of um, have a lot of synergy. And I think that's why this whole like fashion thing um, was a good fit f- for us as well. Yeah, for sure. And are all of these clothing pieces, like the real world ones, meant to be unisex? Um, yeah, almost all of them are. There's a few that aren't. Um, we are like working on some like women's stuff as well. Um, but ju- like initially, we wanted to just focus on unisex stuff c- to get like um, as much like broad, you know, purchases as possible. We we didn't want to like overproduce and have like leftover stock. So that's another thing we're we're dealing with is like the sustainability aspect of these things. How can we, you know, ensure that we're not like overproducing and then having to like put things on sale or clearance, just throw stuff out, you know, um, produce only based on what we need and demand. Um, but yeah, we're now that we're growing a bit more, like we're working on, you know, um, specific like women's cuts and, you know, all these like alternative like unique ways of uh, constructing a garment. Yeah, I was asking because I saw those bankless shorts and they look super sweet, but I'm pretty sure they're meant to be men's swim shorts. Yeah, yeah, those those ones are are definitely swim trunks. Um I'm just I'm just saying if you make a if you make like a a female swimsuit version of that, I can rally all my crypto chicks and get them to buy a piece. That would be cool. I I will definitely hit up uh, the artists. I think we could even, because it's it's just a pattern, right? So we could we could even uh, see if we can make it like uh, sneak it into this this drop this month. Um, that would be a... shorts, but oh yeah, I'm yeah. I'm right. Th- I'm there. I'll be keeping an eye on that. Awesome. Nice. Um. So another thing that uh, I wanted to talk to you about is building community. And that's something that you've done a really good job of. And part of it, I'm sure, is just because you have such a cool, you know, project. And this is something that has never been done before. Nobody else is doing it. And so people are super hyped. But what have been some of the other tactics or strategies that you've been using to build such a strong community that is like so devoted to your products and so willing to like, you know, be part of be be part of the decision making process even in helping you guys grow. Yeah, I think um early on we made like a conscious de- decision to focus on like quality over quantity of community. Um you know, there's a lot of projects that basically are just, you know, trying to be as loud as possible, grow their community as fast as possible, you know, bring as many people in. For us, we were trying to basically filter for people who are really aligned with our mission. Um, and, you know, really liked what we were doing first and foremost, um, instead of just there for some like monetary incentive or number go up or something else. Um, and, you know, we, we had this like tight knit curated community early on. Um, and, you know, it was, it was, it was like, uh, open, but also like exclusive, you know? So there's like that sense of exclusivity and the fact that, you know, this community is being curated helps to keep it really high signal. Um, if there's a lot of just, you know, randoms coming in and making noise and it, it kind of degrades the the you know quality of the you know discourse happening in the community um so you know even we didn't have a token early on we didn't even plan to have a token um so a lot of these people who are really strongly aligned with us before there was any token we retro airdropped like a huge amount of tokens to all these people um and you know that really cemented them as like a strong like core community members who were really aligned with us and what we were doing because they had this like, um, you know, vested interest in, in the upside of, of the, you know, long term of the project. And, you know, we created these token permission chats where you to access like these members only channels and to even access like the weekly members call, you have to be holding like a certain number of tokens. So um, that that also helps like filter these things. And 
um, we've we've been doing like our weekly members call for um, I think like 14 months now pretty much every week for the last like 14 months and um, it's been like really awesome because I think we have like one of the highest like uh, engagement rates of like any community um, you know we consistently have like 20 25 people um, in the members call out of like you know uh, the hundred 150 or so that are um, you know have the token holder holding to access it so there's like a really high engagement rate and because of that you know those conversations and those calls are really you know um people want to be there people want to hear this stuff people want to see what's going on um it's, it's not even it's not so much about you know shilling like what's the next update or like you know here's what you need to know about our project it's more so just you know hanging out having conversations like planning like what's what's happening in the future um yeah, you know, the, the, the primary thing we always say is like, you know, um, you can't compete with someone having fun. So like with everything we do, we try to focus on making it as fun as possible and not really get too caught up in like, you know, oh, we have to like make money and become profitable and, you know, make it a business and crush the competition. It's more so just about like doing what feels right, doing what's fun, doing what we want to do. Um, and because of that, I think, you know, the community really enjoys that. Um, communities all there because they want to be um, and, and they they you know get value out of um, uh, engaging yeah that's awesome I love that um, and then looking forward you know your meta factory is sort of branded at the as this like digi physical uh, culture studio um, so after you know in the future how do you what what plans do you have to expand beyond I guess uh, just wearables you know, in terms of clothing, like, will you also have like headphones, for instance, that like I could wear in the physical space and in the digital or, you know, like different other different products like that? Yeah. So um, th we were actually thinking about this really early on. Um, when I came up with the brand Meta Factory, I wanted it to be like generic enough that it's not just about fashion or merch. That's about any sort of production of any physical good, you know, so it's like there's just the factory to produce anything um versus swagged out which was what the original name was um and i think yeah so we're already starting to experiment with that i think we're uh doing like um we have, we're planning like a line of skincare actually so like meta factory branded like skincare products um working some like uh people who have like connections in like the korean beauty industry and like you know get some nice products made and like bring them bring them here and it's funny because it all started from this tweet that someone made about how like you know all these like dudes in crypto need to like be taking care of themselves better and how we should have like ave cleanser and like compound eye cream and you know these like uh, DeFi branded like skincare products so that was like the inspiration and then we just like ran with it so that's one thing we're working on um there's we plan to like do like a lot of um you know tech lifestyle products so like just useful utilitarian like things um there's uh, i don't have it with me here but we have this like multi-tool thing it's like a knife and like a screwdriver and like all this all these like really cool things um so stuff that we want to use or that we use in our in our lives already and things that we want to see you know um there's like a faraday cage like little pouch for your phone so you can you know block out all signals for you know when you don't want to be tracked and like the kind of like these like crypto cypherpunk, you know, cultural um, utility products um, that we want to like make and put out there. That is super cool. And can you tease any um, partnerships or any collections that are on the verge of dropping in the near future? Hmm. Let's see. A lot of them are, are, are secretive, but I can maybe drop hints. Like um, one of them would be like big uh, crypto game um that we're working with so uh that one soon and then uh y yeah we have uh um we've been wor we've been working like heads down on a lot of really cool stuff for sushi um so we we did like a few pieces for sushi but we're really trying to like take things to the next level and do some really cool stuff so yeah keep an eye out on some some sushi stuff in the next coming months love it uh, more broadly, zooming out, you know, beyond just Meta Factory, where do you see, I'm curious to hear, like, where do you see the metaverse being in 10 years? And I know it's like so hard to predict even what's going to happen next month, let alone in 10 years. But in your sort of perfect world, like if everything progresses, you know, according to plan, where will we be in 10 years with how we interact on the metaverse? 
Yeah, um, I think like, you know, for me, like the metaverse is already here, you know, especially with crypto, like everything we're doing, it's like very metaverse especially with DAOs. And like, for me, like I quit my day job, you know, or like at the start of this year to work full time in crypto. And, you know, I'm, I'm a member of all these different DAOs and I'm earning tokens from them and like exchanging, like it, it does feel like almost a game. Um, so in that way, like, and if you kind of look at the trajectory, like leading up to this, like with social media and the internet and how that evolved, um, the, the common thread I sort of see is like the real world and the digital worlds like merging together. And so for me in 10 years, I think the metaverse is going to be where like the digital and physical worlds are like indistinguishable from one another, you know, where we have like the, the, the tech for, you know, um, AR glasses or even like, you know, brain neural interfaces is like good enough where we can, you know, uh, for example, this podcast, instead of just being screened, we can like be two people sitting on a couch facing each other in like a much more, you know, familiar, like homey environment and have that conversation, even though we're, you know, uh, on different parts of the world. Um, I think, you know, once once we have that and you can uh, the, the line between digital and physical starts to blur, I think that's when like that's for me where I see the metaverse going, whether we reach it in 10 years or 20 years or five years. I think that's up to like how fast we progress. But. Um, I think that's that's the direction it's going. I love it. And uh, n- another thing that I've heard a lot of people speculate on is, you know, we saw earlier this year the NFT boom with artwork as the primary NFT use case. What do you see as being the next big NFT use case that's really going to make it to the mainstream? Um, yeah, so for me, I think like NFT art really took off, but um, people got really tunnel visioned on it kind of like how people got tunnel vision on like ICOs in 2017. And for me, like the NFT, like art scene is kind of like starting to feel like that. Um, Just because like that one use case was like so successful that people like stopped, you know, um, thinking like, what else can we do with these things? Um, And, you know, for for example, in, in the whole DeFi space, like all the innovation happened in like the bear market when people were forced to like innovate and like push, push the, um, you know, bleeding edge forward. So I think for NFTs, I'm most excited about, you know, um, not necessarily just like, you know, here's art attached to an NFT or here's like um, a piece of fashion attached to an NFT, but more so about like the culture, the access, the community and the utility, like, you know, getting this NFT, like unlocking an experience, um, you know, in, in Metafactory, for example, we're creating a virtual store where you can actually like, walk around and see stuff and buy stuff. And, you know, we want to create it where if you have like the the Genesis jacket or one of our like high end pieces that has a chip on it and you like scan the chip, it like gives you access to like a secret underground club or something. And, you know, so in, in that sense, I think NFTs with like utility and that unlock access and that, you know, are, are dynamic and have like, you know, um, it enables you to do things that you couldn't without the NFT. So beyond just like collecting. Um, I think that's that's what I'm interested in. I think that's where it's going. Um, and even you look at these like profile picture, um, like avatar projects that drop, you know, Bored Apes um, kind of like it was like the, the first like good example of it where it's it's not about the art. It's about the access to the community and, you know, being a part of this like yacht club and, you know, getting to like draw on the wall um, of that like virtual bathroom. Um, I think these are all examples that show that, you know, the, it is really about the community and the access and, you know, being a part of this like exclusive social club. Yeah, 100%. And even through that, I'm hearing a lot of different concepts like there's the NFTs. There's also like the community aspect comes, I think, heavily from DAOs or at least DAOs, you know, helped really um, bring that to the forefront of people's attentions. And then there's obviously DeFi involved in it as well. And so I think like moving forward, uh, do you, I, I see it as sort of, you know, DeFi, NFT, DAOs, like all of these different concepts are going to all blend together into the metaverse. And so we won't be talking about DAOs separately from NFT, separately from DeFi. It'll all just be uh, together and all, all be part of our day-to-day lives. Is that how you see it as well? Yeah, like um, even, so we did ETH Denver 2020, like over a year ago now, a year and a half ago. That's when like we did our first like main public presentation for Metafactory. And we, we we had a slide on there that was basically, you know, we're sort of a blend of like DeFi, NFTs, DAOs, um, gaming and streetwear, you know, and it's not 
it's not about those individual components as much as it is like the the emergent um thing that you get by putting them together um so for for us you know we we leverage DeFi for robot token you know we have a liquidity pool rewards for that you know all these like tokenomics um on, on the DeFi level where people contributing to metafactory have this token they can choose whether they want to cash it out into fiat to pay their bills or how much they want to hold on to for like you know long term upside um you know so that, that there's a DeFi aspect nfts of course with these virtual wearables the metaverse um all, all that side of thing and then um DAOs, which is like metafactory is a DAO, and we're using all these like different coordination tools like source cred and coordinate and you know um snapshot for governance and you know uh metafactory is like it's basically like a um a decentralized coordination research collective disguised as a merch shop um you know a, a lot of what we do is like figuring all these things so the you know DAOs are cool on its own nfts are cool on its own DeFi is cool on its own but they're cooler than the sum of its parts when you put them all together a hundred percent yeah a hundred percent Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I end every podcast episode with a quick segment I call Explain Your Tweet. This is where I dig through your Twitter and I pull out some interesting or cryptic tweets and I give you a chance to explain them on the podcast. So the first one I've got here is from July 25th, 2021. You said, complexity emerges from simplicity. Build primitives, not platforms. Do you want to explain that? Yeah. So, yeah, basically... um, you know, kind of seeing how like a lot of projects from like 2017 till now, like what things worked and what things didn't work. There's a lot of people that tried to build these like big monolithic platforms that tried to do everything. Um, and none of those really panned out. But if you look at, you know, um, something like Yearn Finance, uh, it's like no one could have come up with Yearn Finance on its own. It, like we needed ERC-20s and then Uniswap and then Compound and all these like sort of primitives and building blocks and through like the simple like ERC-20 token primitive like once we discovered that it allowed for us to like explore in a new direction and then things emerged out of that and things emerged out of that and then eventually we came to what is like year in finance you know um so I think when whenever like we're designing these like new paradigms in in web3 um I think it's important not to like overcomplicate it um, and, and try to build like these really complex things, but instead focus on like doing one thing well and then composing with everything else, you know, focus on interoperability, composition, collaboration um, for, for Metafactory, right? We're, we're hyper focused on this one vertical of like just doing merch really well. You know, if every community was to try to figure out their own merch, they'd probably do a, a crappy job and, you know, waste a bunch of resources. But, you know, we we've spent that like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and time and effort to like figure out the production and, you know, um, the materials and like really upping the quality, like, and then we can open that up for everyone else to use and, and plug into. Um, and if everyone does that, we can create these like building blocks and it allows people to then, you know, uh, be creative and plug them in in interesting ways and do, um, allow that like cool, complex stuff to emerge out of it. Um, and it's, it's almost like, biomimicry in from like how nature works right you can kind of derive all the complexity of nature from like simple like mathematical you know constants like you know the um, golden ratio or the fibonacci sequence and pi like those like fundamental like things from that you can derive all of the complexity of life um so you know the, the more we try to like uh operate in the way like the universe and nature operates i think the more successful we'll be. That's deep. I'm glad I gave you a chance to explain that. I would not have come up with any of that on my own. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, it gives us a, a lot to think a good about. one to pick for sure. Yeah. Well, and then I've got one more. Uh, this is from July 23rd, 2021. So I, I didn't have to dig very deep because you've got a lot of good stuff on your Twitter. And I think you just got back from ETHCC. So I think there were a lot of uh, a lot of thoughts tweeted from Paris in the last week or two. Um, but this one, you said broke is prediction market and bespoke is cu- curation game. I think you alluded to this, uh, the curation game um, earlier in this interview, but uh, do you want to go ahead and explain that a little bit? Yeah, so I think, you know, people have been talking about prediction markets for a long time. And I think it is a really powerful paradigm, but it's had like, 
some sort of difficulty like taking off or really being used and i think it's sort of the framing of it um prediction market sort of implies that it's like you're, you're gambling and like you're speculating on like the work of someone else or other things that are happening um but reframing a prediction market as a curation game uh changes that changes that narrative to be more so as a curator you are providing value by curating you know so it's you're not just speculating and you know gambling on what's going to happen but more so um you're curating what's valuable and what should happen and that your opinion is what you know adds value into that ecosystem and uh, it's a game because you know for for metafactory we're using the curation game to curate merch you know what merch we should drop so it's not just like one time you know predict what's going to happen but more so it's like a game loop you know you're you're continuously like uh guessing what's going to happen like reallocating your things to the next thing like it's a it's a dynamic interactive um multi-dimensional like type of experience so i think you know uh people are going to start using um curation games for a lot of other things as well if you watch vitalik's talk at ecc he talks about you know the future of crypto beyond DeFi, um and you know taking a look at social media and like discourse online and how you know quality of the conversation isn't necessarily correlated with like what gets the most attention and you know the things that get the most attention are usually low quality so like how do we fix these things um and even in crypto like if people don't talk about it enough but you know web3 burnout is like a real thing you know there's just such an information overload of like things happening and things going on um and it's because like all of us are individually like you know doing all our own research and having to look at everything but if we have like markets um where we can curate this data and have incentives for people to um do high quality curation then we can sort of titrate like how much information we want to know like just give me like you know the top 5% of stuff this week on DAOs you know instead of me having to like look at everything on Twitter and just take all this information and so um i think you know a curation game is a much better framing for the value that you know prediction markets provide yeah another very insightful and deep tweet man now i'm like how how do we get you to explain every tweet you have cuz you have so many tweets like this and i feel like people just aren't getting the value that is actually in this tweet just by reading it yeah for for me like i almost treat twitter as like a a place to like um write down my like latent thoughts so like it makes sense to me or it's kind of like a really like distilled like um you know cuz i i don't want to write a whole blog article about it but like just having that there i think like anchors it and then i can you know you can have conversations about it and it can you know bring it up and remember you know what context you tweeted that in and what it's connected to so yeah i think um i i i get asked that question a lot too from people like coming into crypto or coming into like you know they're not used to using twitter or engaging on twitter and they're like you know how do i tweet like what do, what should i say to like get and you know people kind of think of it as like it should be some sort of crafted thing but i tell people you know you should just like use it as like um a way to like write down your thoughts um and you know have like think out loud where everyone can see what you're thinking um and you don't really have to craft anything it's just like you know um write down your thoughts as they come and then the people who are who align with your way of thinking are going to connect with you and you're going to be able to connect with others who also align um in that way so you know like twitter was really the thing that like allowed me to you know connect with people in the space like see what's going on um you know really go from just being like a outsider you know observing to to being actively involved um yeah for sure i can say the same thing for myself so thank you twitter but at the same time you know it's like uh there's a dark side to twitter as well and oh, yeah. <laughs> you know I, I do think we need a a better alternative but um we'll get there yeah yeah 100% but thank you twitter for bringing us together for this podcast interview we can at least you know thank twitter yeah. for that um awesome well thank you so much meta dreamer for being here today before you go tell can you just tell people where they can find you if they want to connect with you personally and then also where they can go to learn more about meta factory and then for people who are new to meta factory what are some like initial cool easy things that they can do right away when they go on your website um yeah sure so you can find me on twitter at meta underscore dreamer um that's me and then meta factory is at the meta factory um from from our twitter you should be able to like find your way around to everything else like there's a link to our website and and other interesting things um uh, in terms of people who like 
are interested in Metafactory and like what they can do, um, jump in our Discord, you know, introduce yourself, like see all the stuff people are posting and doing um, and, and bring your cool ideas. Um, I think, you know, a, a lot of people when it comes to like being a part of these like crypto communities and DAOs, like they ask like, oh, what should I do? Or like, what can I do? Um, but I think it's more so about you telling us what to do. You know, like uh, it's a lot of like unlearning that needs to happen where people don't expect to just like walk into like a Google office and sit down and start working, you know. Um, but that's really how it works in DAOs. You can just like show up and start doing stuff. And, you know, if, if people find it cool, then it'll, you know, progress. And, you know, next thing you know, you're you're part of the core team. <laughs> um, that happens a lot, actually. Um, so, yeah, I think just, you know, explore, see what see what resonates with you and then, you know, come join the Discord and talk about it. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds great. Well, thanks again so much for taking the time to come on the podcast today and telling us all about Metafactory. I can't wait to follow along and see what happens. Also, I really want to see a female swimsuit version of that bankless pattern because I'm obsessed with it. Um, and I, yeah, let, let's stay in touch and uh, maybe we can see how we can collab in the future as well. For sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was really awesome. And yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to, to the bankless team right after this. Awesome. Um, getting those shorts up. <laughs> I can't wait. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, listeners, for tuning in as always. And we'll be back again soon with another episode of the Unstoppable Podcast.